Hello, everyone. Welcome uh, to the presentation from Chapel Hill. We're delighted to have a, a live audience as well as have our virtual audience. And I thank uh, UNC Chapel Hill for hosting us, particularly Margareta Yarbrough, who's arranged all the logistics. It's my pleasure today to introduce my colleague, Lynn Silipini Conaway. She is a senior research scientist at OCLC Research. She has experience in academic, public, and school libraries, as well as library and information science education. Dr. Conway leads the user behavior and synthesis research activity area at OCLC Research, which includes user and non-user investigations, utilizing both quantitative and qualitative methods, such as log analysis, interviews, observations, and diaries. She is the co-author of the fourth and fifth editions of the basic research methods for librarians, published numerous papers in referee journals, and presents her research in both national and international venues. Joining OCLC Research, she was the Vice President of Research and Library Systems at NetLibrary, the Director of the Library Information Services Department at the University of Denver, and on the facility of the Library and Informational Science Program at the University of Missouri, Columbia. Dr. Conway. Thanks, Eric. Uh, thank you, and, and thank you for attending today. And I, I also would like to thank um, the UNC Chapel Hill Libraries for hosting us. So uh, any of you who have heard me speak before, I like to read some of the quotes from the individuals who we've interviewed. And so uh, I will have my glasses and my notes, and I'll try not to go over time, uh, and so I'll try to wrap it up so that we may have time for discussion, but I get so involved in uh, reading these quotes that uh, I carried away. Uh, verse can hear, sorry, I'm walking around. It's hard for me to stay in one position. Uh, okay, this is the first quote, and this is from our visitor, Digital Visitors and Residents Project, and it's a three-year project, and we are following some individuals over a three-year period. And so we talk to them weekly, uh, on a monthly basis. There's something, excuse me. Talk to them on a, a monthly basis. And we have interviewed uh, 61 individuals to begin with. This person is a U.S. You can see our coding here. A U.S. undergraduate student, which means she was in her first year of her undergraduate studies. Um, a female, age 19, and a political science major. And this is what she's saying about Google and why it's so easy. It could be that the library user built his or her uh, work for around the library okay? because at the time we were the only game in town and that's changed drastically and I don't have to tell any of you this. Uh, now we, the librarians, have to build our services and our systems around our users' workflow. And that's what I want to talk about a little bit today. This is something that Lorcan and Dempsey uh, has coined, I guess, we can say, um, the Outside In and Inside Out Library. Uh, this was published in Educause in December 2012. You know, we do several things. And the Outside In is that we acquire books, journals, databases from all these external sources. And then we provide this discovery system for our local constituency. I've been trying to get away from users because we're trying to talk to people who don't use library as well because we want to bring them in. So I've been trying to think of another term besides users, non-users, uh, patrons. I've been thinking of constituents, academic community. Those are the terms, or community if you're in a public library setting. The inside out, is that now libraries are producing a, a wide range of resources. Because what are we doing? We're digitizing images. We're digitizing special collections. We have our learning and research materials. Data reuse, reuse is a very hot topic now. So it, librarians are actually at the forefront of much of this with the researchers within our communities. We also have all of these uh, administrative records. And what we're trying to do is to promote this discoverability of those resources that we have that no one else has. That's a new task as well. Again, from local to global, 
linear to linked, print to digital. And you know, when I sometimes look at mappings and things, I realize that I am very linear. Uh, because when others, uh, my colleagues, are looking at these mappings, they're crazy making to me. Um, but to many people in this linked environment, that's the way they think. Again, I don't have to tell you about these. We have um, budget cuts, um, high retirement rates, as we're hearing, uh, hiring freezes. I don't know if you're experiencing that, but many who I've talked to are. I think that we have some great opportunities as well. I always try to look for the opportunities. And I think right now we, we are almost have to look for the best value for the most use. And I think in order to do that, we need to understand how, why, and under what circumstances individuals use systems and services, but other um, external ones as well. I always think of what Henry Kissinger said, um, a diamond is a chunk of coal good under pressure. And I think that's where we are at this point. The library, what's that? We've been hearing a, a lot of that from our, um, our, our subjects in our studies. Uh, we have US, UK students in the Digital Visitors and Residence Project. Uh, I, we've been asking some of the same questions since 2003. So we've had thousands of people answering some of these same questions. The way we have a longitudinal study, uh, just from all of the research we've done asking these similar questions, and now with this new study that we're um, talking to these ind individuals for three years. I have a quote uh, once said, because uh, there's a, a UK graduate student, female, age 25, early modern history. Because, I mean, the thing that annoys me most is when these things online, unlike library catalogs, it's supposed to be a really good way for looking for books, but usually they are so bad that you are sort of stuck between the two worlds of you can't go ask someone for anything. You're supposed to use the Internet, but they're not very well developed. So they're saying the library is not very well developed in this Internet world. One of the things you heard to talk about with libraries is books. That's what we found, that when individuals talk to us about the library, they talk about books. Often don't even realize that we are offering these electronic resources that they're using. Convenience trumps all. And one thing you have to remember is that Convenience is based upon the context and the situation of the need at the time. So what's convenient for me today here in Chapel Hill may not be convenient for me tonight when I'm in a different place. And we have to remember that. And we talk, when people talk about some of their research results, and they often talk about this blanket statement that people do this or that, you have to understand how and why they do these things. Many individuals satisfy and learn that a lot. They'll, they'll get you know, enough. What, what are requirements? Uh, what will we buy? I'm going to do it because I need to move on. Individuals also really value human resources, whether it's face-to-face, -face, whether it's in the virtual environment, they are so very high on the list of sources that, that people use. This is taken um, from some of our research, also from uh, a study that we have done uh, for the UK, for JISC in the UK. And it's, um, they were asking us to look at, to create a profile of the researcher today and to look at studies that were done in the US in the UK from 2005 to 2010 and come up with some major themes. Okay, what we learned? Power browsing. Now, to scan small chunks of information, view just a few pages, or um, I read something today, um, somebody posted in Facebook that there was an article out in Slant 
that said that individuals will read just above that fold, what we call the fold on the, the screen, and that most people, most of the tweets and most of the Facebook postings come from those individuals who don't even read the article, just come from that top, that first few sentences. Often it's just an image. All the individuals who look at the information online and, and slant are going to images and any of the videos. So that started giving me some ideas for things we can do. Uh, people uh, also don't do a lot of real reading. Now, think about it. How much information do you get every day? A lot. Uh, how, how many of you read, those of you in the audience, and I think uh, uh, Melissa, people can raise their hands uh, on, online in the webinar. How many of you read everything from front beginning to end when you get um, some information? Someone will say, look at this article. How many of you read all of everything? No. How many of the first few lines say, oh, that's interesting, I'll come back? Yeah, most of us. Um, what we say often is this is squirreling. We squirrel away information. And so we can do these short basic searches. We download this content for later. How do you find that later? Some people are Um I, I know I have it somewhere. I don't always know where I filed it. I have many folders. And individuals do that as well, and they may never go back. I think this is about food. When I travel, I squirrel away food. Uh, the bag that I carry is so heavy, and the bit is food. And it's because I'm afraid I'm going to be stranded somewhere without something to eat. Do I usually eat it? No. When I opened the package the other day, it said 2005 on the little bar, so I threw it away. That's how long I've had it, and that's what people do with information. Now, people also work differently, and it's, it's dependent upon discipline, and also the more one is immersed within the subject, uh, their behaviors are quite different. And what we've learned that is that um, researchers in the sciences are most satisfied with the information they're finding. Arts and humanities scholars are saying that they have some serious problems getting access to, uh, they said, a back, a back journal articles, uh, knowledge languages, and we had a very nice uh, presentation this morning about non-English uh, content, non-published content. Uh, so their awareness of um, open access is very low when you talk to researchers. They don't uh, really understand uh, all of the consequences. And there was a lack of understanding of copyright and publisher agreements with the researchers and scholars' own work. So they did not know what they signed off for copyright. They did not know what rights they had. And so I think this is another area where we can provide expertise. The students, um, they did, uh, determine their credibility, they tell us, by common sense. Uh, their common sense. Boss checking, by reputation of a company or an organization. They said that they look for .edu, .ac outside of the U.S., uh, .gov, uh, sometimes .org, but they're not sure about that. Uh, they also look for credible recommendations. And I have some quotes. This is um, a U.S. student, graduate, uh, I'm sorry, U.S. secondary school student, male, age 17, um, and he wants to go into mechanical engineering when he graduates. Uh, well, I don't like to pick the first one I see, so the first listing that comes up on Google. I try to evaluate two or three and see if there's some common things between them. Like if two of them say the same thing, then that must be right. Uh, when like one versus two consistent things. This is a uh, U.S. graduate student, female, age 45, uh, bioinformatics and genomics. Um, uh, yeah. So I usually check, I try to test the information. If it's my judgment or also knowledge in the subject or 
or I will read more to see if the information is right or not. I don't trust it like from the first second. This is a U.S. faculty male, age 40, biology. You know, let's say it's not even in an academic context, because we did ask about personal and academic. I see the same conclusion reached by lots of different people in different contexts. But I need to see the same answer again and again and again. And maybe at some point that's enough time where it just starts to gel to me that this is probably a good approximation of the truth. It may not be the tr truth, but this seems to be what a lot of people perceive as the truth. So that would be the simplest way to do it. To researchers in um, New Zealand, they were computer science faculty. We talked to them in 1996, and then we went back in 2011 to talk to the same individuals and ask them the same questions. And one of the things that they told us are self-taught in finding um, and getting information. And they said that now they're very dependent upon their graduate students in teaching them. But when we talk to the graduate students, they say that they're dependent upon their major professors to help them learn how to do the research and find the information. So it's a circle. Um, there was a study done in in the UK, funded by JISC, and I think it was completed about a year and a half ago, and they talked to doctoral students, and they all said that they learned from their major professors or dissertation professors on, on how to get information. This is a big surprise. Google, Wikipedia, uh, they also use library websites, uh, e-journals, as I said, they may not know that they come from the library or provided by the library, but they do use them. Uh, human resources, uh, students, classmates, they are on Facebook a lot, and they communicate with their peers in Facebook, and they share information about assignments in that way. So uh, their um, family and relatives it used to be when we asked them about, they'd say their parents. And when we would probe, and this hasn't come up a lot lately, about three years ago when we did this, that we would probe and say, well, your parents, your mother, your father, and they would often say, we go to our father. And when asked why, they would say, because our mother wants to teach us to find the information. Our fathers will give us the information. Uh, and that tells us something about us as librarians. We want to teach people to find information and go out and be self-sufficient. Uh, that's not necessarily what they want. You know, give me, I'm in a hurry. And we read thousands of question point uh, transcripts for reference, and that's what we found. I have five minutes. Yeah. The answer, I got to go. Uh, so uh, that's something we need to remember. Graduate students, professors, advisors, mentors, and they mentioned electronic databases. Uh, see that researchers uh, talk about Google, uh, Web of Science, JSTOR. JSTOR comes up a lot. And I don't know why, but it does. I, I, one man told me one day, I couldn't find anything, and a librarian helped me. And she showed me something called JSTOR. And I went and I got what I needed. She said, every time I have a question, I go to JSTOR. So, you know, that teachable moment. And JSTOR isn't the perfect place for all of his research needs. But it worked once, it's going to work again. Um, as my colleague says, you know, you have a hammer, so everything looks like a nail. And you're going to go in and use that. The journals, what we're hearing is access is more important than discovery. They want to get into it. They talk about not wanting to have to use logins or passwords. They want this immediate access. Uh, Google Scholar comes up a lot with um, some of the researchers. Uh, they really uh, find information through Google. And with the journals, and you probably see this when you look at your statistics, they visit only a few minutes. 
um, they have frustration locating and accessing uh, full text copies of information. I have a, a, one quote, and this is uh, from a focus group interview, and this was in 2005, and it was a faculty. And the faculty member said, I will go into the research databases and usually start with palm abstracts or go to some other, you know, similar type of, you know, database. And do a search there. And then I will end up, uh, because I am, this is a hurried thing, um, limiting myself to the articles that are available online as opposed to the ones that I would have to specifically go to the library and make a copy of. You know, because it's quick. I know that there are other articles, but I limit myself to the ones I can get online. And you know, the most recent ones tend to be online, so I luck out in that way. Satisficing. Uh, this is a, a U.S. secondary school student, female, age 17, said, I can find the information I need to on other sites besides the library. But looking at the author, I tried to use a lot of college websites or the university database. They talking about the faculty really like those websites because they're legitimate. This is from the Digital Visitors and Residents, and this is just uh, some of the data that we've been collecting and, and analyzing. We have a whole lot more to go. This will probably take me well into my retirement years. And we see that this experiencing, this is the educational stage. That is last year of secondary school, high school, first year of university. Why are we going back to high school for this? Because we often tend to be reactive and we believe we should be more proactive. We probably should be talking to the four-year-olds right now um, because things are changing so rapidly. We'll see with the databases how, um, how they're really used very highly within the uh, experiencing, the embedding of those last two years of undergraduate, the establishing are your graduate students, doctoral and master students, and you'll see that there's a decline in database use, and also, um, a decline with the faculty, the, the emerging, I'm sorry, it's the opposite way. The emerging are the lower ones, so they increase. We, the emerging, are using the databases, problem is, they don't know that they are databases. Don't call them that. So when we're talking to them, we do not put our terms into um, their words. And so telling us what they're using, and we think they're using more databases than they tell us. I think the interesting thing here, what I noticed, was the low number of them using electronic books. I don't know if that surprises you, but it surprised us. And a low number of them using um, online textbooks. But this one, we we combined digital with their mentions of school, their mentions of academics. So we're trying to find out if they're getting this from their school libraries, their academic libraries, uh, and so that's what we were trying to find in in, in this. And you can see uh, that with the graduate students and the scholars, um, how much information they get digitally, and they recognize that it is from the library. And we're thinking that in those lower stages, they're not understanding that they get it from the library. Wikipedia. Uh, how many of us use Wikipedia? I will admit that we use Wikipedia. Yes, okay, thank you. Uh, that's, we're finding that a lot. Uh, and the um, individuals are often not very happy about telling us that they use Wikipedia. And you'll see that, um, I'll read some quotes. Uh, you'll also see the major media sites, and they increase with the, the graduate students. And those, we're looking at news sites, um, you know, the type of more popular sites, which I think probably makes make sense when you look at these data. The Wikipedia issue, we felt that individuals are using Wikipedia, but they often don't want to admit it. And so we're calling it the learning black market uh, because it is um, this covert online study habit that we have that we really don't want to talk about. 
when I talk to individuals, especially the undergraduates and, and the um, high school students, I ask them, do you cite Wikipedia? Oh, no. What do then? Well, we cite the references at the end of the Wikipedia article. You go and read them. No. enough not to cite it. Now here is some, um, this is a UK secondary school student, female, age 16. When we asked her about Wikipedia, she said, avoid it. Uh, this is a US undergraduate student, male, age 19, mechanical engineering. I mean, if teachers don't like using Wikipedia, they don't want you to use Wikipedia. A lot of students will still use Wikipedia and then cite another source. As long as it has the same information and it's not word for word or anything, they'll use Wikipedia because it's the easiest thing to go up. It will give you a full, in-depth, detailed thing about the information. Teachers just don't like it because it's not the most reliable source. Since anyone can post something on there, even though the site is monitored, it's because it's too easy. That's why. This is U.S. undergraduate student, female, age 19, political science. They professors say it's because anyone can make up. I mean, anyone can add information on, on there. I mean, when I've actually looked into information, it seems the same as any information I find anywhere else. I mean, it's not like if you look up 4th and July, it's not like it gives you like, like some weird explanation of aliens or something. This is a U.S. Uh, undergraduate student, female, um, age 19. Political science. I use it kind of like I won't cite it on my papers, but I kind of use it as a like as a start off line. I there and look up the general information, kind of read through it so I get a general idea of what it is. Then I start going through my research. And this is a UK undergraduate with students, you know, age uh, 19, French and Italian major. Everyone knows that you try not to use Wikipedia as a source because it is a cardinal sin. Now, evaluating sources, we try to find out how they determine what sources they're going to use, what they're going to go after, and again, as I said in the beginning, convenience trumps all. Uh, it's convenient at that moment is what I'm going to use. Uh, authority legitimacy comes up quite a bit with that um, undergraduate and uh, high school. And they're really concerned about that, which I think is a good start. Uh, they're worried about it. You see it diminishes a bit um, with the um, upperclassmen undergraduates. But then again, it's, it's, it becomes very important with our um, the graduates and the scholars. We looked at reliability, relevance, and currency, see how they played a part in this. Uh, relevance is very high for the um, emerging state, and uh, it, it continues, uh, as you can see, but the highest is for those, that, that first group of, of scholars, researchers, I guess we should call them. Currency um, seems to be most important with the graduate students, which makes sense. As you know, you're doing your research, you want to be sure that no one else has done what you've done, you want to be sure you're citing, you're looking for a theoretical framework. So I think all that, that makes sense to us. Um, reliability is, is important. When you ask people, again, about finding, you know, how do you know what's reliable, they don't. Try to tell by the way a website looks. Uh, they look at someone's credentials. Now, you know, what they, you know on the inter Internet, you can be a dog. I mean, you can put anything up for your credentials, who's going to check. But that's how individuals are, are assessing. Uh, website looks, ends in the .edu, those sorts of things. We look for uh, motivation, and uh, we see this um, collaboration is, is quite strong. It, it decreases with the upperclassmen undergraduates and with the graduate students. But I think at that point in our educational stage, 
we are really concerned about our research, making our mark, being immersed in this subject area. Uh, collaboration is much more important with the, the younger students, and I mean in years, but younger in the, their experience as um, researchers, than with our scholars and, and research faculty. Quite interesting is the email. If you look at, at the email, the emerging stage, which is the top one, 50% of them use email. It's 100% for those who have gotten into our academic institutions. And what we think is how we communicate in the academic world, mostly through email. We talk to individuals, and we ask them, like we ask them to send diaries to us on a monthly basis, or we we talk to them. They always email them to us. Question: Why are you emailing us this information? Even if they video, they email the link to us. So we do that, and they says we look at you as part of our academic work, and we always use email for our academics. It's almost like they be, become acclimated or brought into this culture, this email culture, which I think is uh, one of the, the most interesting things we found. Now, in 2008, when we asked screenagers about email, and that's your, your 12 to 18-year-olds, they want. They said email was for old people. They were blunt. The students we're talking to now are, are much, um, much nicer to us. <laughs> uh, that face-to-face -face is still important. Uh, it's something that we hear a lot, even with um, the younger people. They'll often say, you know, we text all the time. Sometimes it's nice to talk to someone, to see someone's face, which I find very enlightening and exciting to hear. Uh, texting. It's very important um, with the uh, emerging stage and the establishing. It becomes less important with the experiencing, with our researchers, our scholars. Florian was only essential once in our original interviews, and we interviewed 61 people. There was one participant, and it was he, it was in he was in North Carolina, not here, and I was talking to him, a US um, uh, graduate, male, age nineteen, and he kept talking about the lady in the library who helps you find things. And something you should never do as a researcher is put a, a word or words in your subject's mouth. So what did I say? I, I, I just this went on and on. This was an hour and 45 minute interview. And finally I said, Oh, this And he looked at me and he said, No, it's a lady in the library. So I said, Okay. Uh, so I don't know, maybe she wasn't a librarian. I don't know that. But I just, this was something that I thought we really need to bring out because we had to add librarian to our code book since it was not mentioned in verse 61. This is something that um, came from the study, um, a UK study, and it, the majority of the British Library website visits were from a search engine. So 84% of them to get to the British Library website came from a search engine. And um, many began to search on the library website. Any ideas? No, it's better than that. One. <laughs> Everyone's saying zero here in the room. One percent. Uh, and then this came from a study in 2013, and they said in the past 12 months, uh, they interviewed uh, individuals, and 25 percent of the Americans uh, said that they visited a library website, and 13 of them said they used a handheld device to actually access the library website. So all of this, what does this mean? Well, you know, we've been 
talking about OPACs for quite a long time. And we really need to start thinking about the community uh, as content and into that a little bit on the next slide. But uh, full text, online, accessible, I mean, the more we can get out there in full text, the better. Uh, the seamless discovery, this mobile access. We, do, you, do any of you here use virtual reference um, texting or in the mobile? How is that? Is it working well? Um, we don't a lot via text, but we did it last year. Yeah. That's what we found. And when we question people about the texting, it, the reactions are, are real funny because often they'll say, Ooh, I'm going to text. A librarian, I you know, text my family and my friends. But, you know, so I, I found that to be quite off-putting to me, uh, which I would never have thought of. But that seems to be very popular, and we're finding that as well. Uh, also, we need to be, have a presence in the social networks. And one of my colleagues on a, an IMLS grant, uh, Shrug Shaw, is on the the faculty of the uh, uh, Rutgers University. You may know him. He was a doctoral student here. And he's not a librarian. And he said to me one day, you know, you librarians think that you're going to put a web page up that says this is your library um, and, or have a Facebook page and say this is your library and people are going to actually use it. That's not what you do in, in, a, in a, this social environment. And, and he says, and the same thing with Twitter. You, know, you need to change the way you think. And, and he's absolutely right. And I, and some people have changed the way that they're going. Uh, I, there was a, a publication in the Chronicle of Higher Ed last January. It was January 2012. And um, it talked about the University of Nevada, Reno, and how they have that Facebook with they took two students from the 1913 who are very prominent in their actual special collections. So they digitized the special collections. Then they have these two people talking. They ended up getting married um, eventually. But they have them, I'm going here, I'm playing soccer, you know, and have this whole uh, sauna set up. And they had thousands of friends. And Facebook made them take down the two individuals because they are not alive. However, when I talked to the university librarian, she said that the, the use of that digitized special collection increased astronomically by making it come alive and making it pertinent to, in today's environment. Uh, so, and she said it, it's still, I went on the other day to check. I often check because it's interesting. They post things about what they're doing and where they're going that night. It's just sort of fun. And they still have a lot of followers and, and they're still very active. Um, so, you, and you may do this as well. The University of Washington includes references in Wikipedia for their uh, salmon collection, their special collection. And I noticed you're nodding, so you do some of that as well with your um, special collections. Good. Uh, one of the things I think we are lacking in our OPACs, and, and Lorcan Dempsey talks about this in that article I referred to earlier, is this, this whole tagging, commenting, rating, recommending, reviewing. And we have a study uh, that we're conducting with, uh, we have a doctoral student at the University of Sheffield, and we got a grant to fund him for three years to work with us on looking at worldcat.org and how people engage with that. And we're trying to come up with a way to um, have a recommender system in worldcat.org that, that's more user-based than what, what we have provided in the past. And people really do want views, and they want reviews, but they want them from people, from experts, they, unless it's fiction. If it's fiction, they would like it from you know, their their colleagues, their peers, their friends. But if it's nonfiction, something for research, they want it to be authoritative again. Uh, the they like the ratings as well. They said they like to look at those. 
tagging, we did some uh, statistics in uh, world looking at tagging, and, and it wasn't that popular. And we also looked at um, a university, a private university, uh, where they had tagging. Again, it wasn't that popular, uh, but it seems to be popular in other, uh, in other social networks. We really need to advertise our resources and brands. Um, the, what we found when we were do focus group interviews about worldcat.org outside of the U.S. was that people know about it. We had a focus group interview in the U.K. and there was a young woman who was graduating from her undergraduate program and she said, I'm angry. Our librarians didn't tell us about this the time I was going to school. Now I'm graduating. You know, I would have used this. And when we talked to librarians, they felt that that users at worldcat.org needed an intermediary. They felt they couldn't understand it without a librarian interpreting it. We talked to the graduate and undergraduate students and even the faculty. They thought it was really easy to use and, and very self-explanatory. So I think there's also this discrepancy of what we think people need and what they want. And we should offer chat and instant messaging at the time of need. Think about retail sites, and we have some stats on what people have been doing on retail sites, and they use them quite heavily. Um, not so much the uh, first year undergraduate and first year and uh, last year of high school, but as they progress through their educational phases. And people are used to having a, a little chat box come up. And do you need help? Why we do this in our on our website? In past, I talked to a librarian at St. Louis University, and she said that they decided to try this. And so, if an individual went into the OPAC and retrieved zero hits, they have a pop-up say. For, can we help? She said in the first hour they had 20 people to utilize this. I often hear some librarians say, nobody uses our chat services. Well, they don't understand it. You have Ask a Librarian maybe, which is very, I think is very understandable. But in focus group interviews, people tell us, I wish we could talk chat with a librarian. Well, we can't. Tell them that you can. And so another, other people will often say, I think you can. I think you can click on something that says ask a librarian. And that will give you a librarian. I think there's a librarian somewhere who you chat with. So it, it's our terminology, it's our advertising, our brand. We really need to uh, uh, try to make it more transparent. People make things that are familiar. And so simple, familiar is very helpful to them. Uh, this is a, a great example. This is Trove. And when we were doing interviews at, at, um, in Australia, uh, this Trove came up all of the time. And, and it's their national library. And it, this is their, their catalog. Very simple. I mean, people just love this. Uh, th again, this whole Amazon, like adding things to your cart. I know my public library is doing this now. Uh, it's, it's what people are familiar with. I think when you come down to it, it's all about relationships. We found that out with several of our virtual reference studies. They um, know what we offer. They don't know that they can talk to us and ask us questions. Uh, we talk to librarians and ask them what a successful virtual reference encounter was like, what made it successful. So, uh, they were able to offer instruction, that they could give specialized knowledge, and that it was successful if the user had a positive attitude. 
users of virtual reference services what a successful encounter, virtual reference encounter was for them. They said convenience, fun, and good answer with the service. And got more specific, librarians would say, if I correct answer, really good. If I got the correct answer, when we ask users the correct answer, but they also thought that it was successful if the librarian was nice to them, respected them, and even if they didn't get the right answer, it was successful. So we need to think about that. It's relationship building. Uh, younger, the, the, when we talked to the screenagers, they really did not feel comfortable chatting with a librarian who they did not know. And one said, I know that a librarian isn't some psycho serial killer. <laughs> well, you don't. You know, and we thought, why on earth would they think this? Well, what do we tell people? Do not talk to people you don't know in a virtual environment. That's what we're teaching them. They don't know. You know, you could be posing as a librarian and you're not. But if they knew the librarian from the school, they were very apt to use virtual reference if they thought that that librarian was the one answering that question. They also would use it if it was recommended to them by a librarian they trusted. So it comes to building relationships. I didn't forget that. As most of you know, uh, who know me know, I'll have lots of references. And so you can go back and check all my facts in your spare time. And I will open it up now for any questions or comments. Any do we line this? Well, I think I'm not seeing Okay. We can wait a few minutes and see. See if any any in the audience? Any comments? Because it's just a lunch. <laughs> for that, but that's something, since I'm still interviewing, that's something yeah. I may add. I haven't heard of that. And when I was um, talking to Harley, who did the earlier presentation today, he was saying he had a student, uh, 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 I think a major, uh, middle school age, and he said that he would always, he wanted either Wikipedia, or YouTube. And he, he said, um, well, I asked him, how do you know that the person in YouTube is okay, it's authoritative, or, you know, that that's a legitimate source. Well, you can tell by the way they look. That's what we're hearing with web pages. But maybe we should be doing something with that. that. Oh, okay, sorry, forget about uh, so what Chris asked was, uh, with the virtual reference with the younger um, individuals, if he, if we think or have we talked about maybe having a video chat? And I said we had not done that. I think that's something that we should uh, probably look into. From those of you who offer virtual reference. I, I was going to say that I can see a couple of issues with that. Okay. One would be.
Chris is asking is um, if if um, we just had the one-way video so that the individuals could see the librarian, and, but the librarian wouldn't have a record of the individual because of the the whole privacy issue of identifying someone. So. No, I didn't. So we have a we have a staff member here who was relating uh, some some I think interesting is the one the, since the, these are logged and kept as records, uh, you know, would there be would that be permissible and and there could be issues there. And the second would be if you had the librarian in a public area, uh, it becomes a logistical problem. Do you really want to have a, a dedicated staff member in a appropriate environment to respond? So. Thanks. Any other questions online or in Facebook here? No? Lynn, this is Melissa. The question online. Oh, okay. um, The question is, could, could you talk a bit more about frustrated users who weren't reached at the point of need? Was this a common thread or did most people not mention it? Well, individual, they, they won't say I was frustrated at the time of need. <laughs> uh, but when we ask them to talk about, we use the critical incident technique. So we ask individuals to think of a time where they were unsuccessful when finding information. And that's where we talk about this frustration. Um, I, I have I had other quotes about the library uh, side of things. But I, I've been conducting the monthly um, interviews with our doctors. So it, some of them choose not to write a journal entry, and they'd rather talk. And so we spend an hour every month talking. And a young woman from the U.S. was talking to me. Um, and we talk about both personal and academic. Uh, so we're having issues with both. And she was talking about an academic situation where she was was looking for some information, and it was had to do with one of her projects. It was very obscure about um, uh, the environment, and I think it was something. What I think she was trying to get to was the chemicals used for drilling, um, with like fracking and and those things, and she said it. She, somebody gave her a, um, a website for some institute, and, and she could get through her university library. And she tried to get to that, again, not in the library, and she couldn't access it. And she said she couldn't get the information, and she just kept looking everywhere. And finally, she just went out and found some articles um, just in newspapers and things that she could find openly. But you know, she she didn't say you know I was so frustrated. Well, she said it was very difficult. I was I I didn't have any more time, and so I left the library site. And I know there she kept saying I know there was something in our library. I know there was something in our library. So yes, we are hearing that. Um, we hear it with the personal as well. Talk about personal situations. Uh, usually they um, they are really and getting authoritative information for personal uses. So when they're looking up something, if they're, one of their pets is ill, they have authoritative information. And we often hear this more um, that the authoritative side, with the personal, with the emerging and establishing, especially the emerging, than with their academic work. Uh, if their aunt or the, their friend or they have have some illness. Like one young woman talked to us about mental illness, and her mother had a mental illness, and so she was very concerned that she was going to get this, and was trying to find information online that was authoritative. She didn't want to talk to anyone about it, uh, and so uh, she was very important about that, and about that 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 importance was that authoritativeness. Where did it end up going? Um, there's other people who had 
this man, you know, who, who had family with this illness. So it, it, we, we hear it a lot with frustration. It, well, it doesn't do. Yeah, it, it's that. Yeah, it's that context. Oh, and what what he said is, it's very interesting that um, you know it, it it matters in the personal, and it, and again, it's that whole context situation. And uh, and, and I'm not going to say that with the scholars and the graduate students and the upper class um, undergraduates that it's not important in the academic setting, and even with some of the <clears throat> lower level undergraduates. But you can see that it's that context, the situation. If it's just a class that I'm going to get a pass-fail, and we hear this all the time, I don't care. No, I don't care. <laughs> well, I think we have, we have one more OK, question. one question. So, all right. Uh, this is uh, um, the perception of information abundance leads to an assumption that what, whatever I'm looking for must be out there. Yes. <laughs> that, that's very true. That comes up uh, quite a bit. Uh, there's always something out there. I often ask, and I didn't do it this time, how many of you have really had to find some information and, and found nothing? And usually a couple of people will say yes, and when I ask what it is, it's something very specific, um, and it's often someone who is uh, a researcher or it's non-English uh, language who um, ask others to say, no, I find something. It's satisfying, and yes, people think it's it's there. No matter what, there's something out there that's going to answer that question or or meet that need. Sorry, I have to put on this. Okay, is the email text distinction about message or uh, protocols or devices? Email text. I use a phone for email. Is it still email? Um, when we um, we we weren't taking, you know, we do talk about devices, and um, I get into that. But when we ask them about uh, what do you live, what could you not live without? The, the majority are um, smartphones and laptops, and the email we can. Distinguish between the smartphone and the laptop. Uh, what's interesting is that the um, the emerging stage, so that youngest group, most of them use the laptop for email. They're using it on their phones as much. And I found that um, as well, just in our everyday communications, when we mail them, they'll say, oh, only check my email X number of times. They will say on Facebook they are on constantly. You know, it's there and it's a distraction. And that's something else I didn't talk about. That came up a lot, that it's a distraction to them because they'll try to do something, but they always know that Facebook is there and somebody's there that they can talk who they can talk to. So, well, we wrap it up. Thank you so much for um, being here with us today and for giving us your time. Thanks.